God wants us to live a life with no regrets. Amen? He wants, you know, we, as believers, we're not to, as God's people, we're not to hold our heads down living life. We don't get up uh, with a defeated attitude. We are winners. Hello, somebody. We may not win like some people who win, but we win the right way. We don't win the wrong way. We win the right way. We must, we must approach life with that, pers- that, with that attitude, with that positive attitude. Um, Paul says, I must, you must run in a way to win. And sometimes you have to put yourself through training, rigorous training, to set your life up to win. And in this sermon series, we, <coughs> we're talking about the emotional training that is needed to win. Uh, emotional intelligence is critical to success. And success, when we talk about success, we're talking about the abundant life. When Jesus said, Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy, the devil, uh, but Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is a life that we will be able to live, that we will have no regrets at the end of it. In other words, when we live our life successfully in Christ, you may not get the life you want, but you will get the life you will want to live all over again. And that is the amazing thing about Christ, is that he helps us to live our life as champions. No matter what we're going through, no weapons formed against us, we are more than conquerors. Tell your neighbor, you're a conqueror in Christ. (coughs) And emotional intelligence is critical to that success. We are not to let our emotions run our life. Hello, somebody. We need God's spirit to run our life. How many people know we need God's spirit? The scripture says, walk in the spirit that you may not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And this is um, the work that God does in us. Being emotional intelligence, being emotionally intelligent involves knowing what is going on inside you. We talked about that in the first sermon. The second sermon, we talked about um, being emotional intelligent by being present before people. And last week, we talked about um, having self-control. So we need to know how, we need to have self-awareness, we need to have social awareness, and we need to have self-management. Well, today we're going to be talking about the last and final piece that is required for emotional intelligence, and uh, that has to do with our relationships. Amen? Glory to God. And that's why I just love the way the service was going today, because it just felt like the Lord was already preaching the sermon before we got there. But it has to do with our relationships. And if we were to be truly honest about our, with ourselves, Many of the relationships that we have are set up as ticking time bombs. Many of the relationships we have are set up as ticking time bombs. What do I mean? It's, it's the idea that they can explode at any time with the wind, the slightest wind of conflict. How is it possible that two brothers who could be brothers for 40 years, after an argument, all of a sudden never talk to each other? How is it possible that a marriage that has been together for 20 plus years have an argument and all of a sudden it ends in a bitter divorce? These are, these are examples of our relationships exploding and becoming bombs, that bombshells that just blow up into our lives and into our homes and into our schools, our workplaces. <coughs> and the reason why this happens is because that many of us build our relationships on the foundation of condition, conditions. We set up human conditions to determine if the relationship is healthy. And you may know this, I may know this, when you hear statements like, if you really loved me, you wouldn't treat me that way. Eh? If you really respected me, you wouldn't have done that. Those are conditions that we put upon relationships. And some really, (coughs) sorry, setting relationships like this is no different than conflicting nations setting up boundaries uh, between each other. And they form peace treaties. And they say to each other, you and I will have peace. So as long as you don't cross this line, we get along fine. As long as you don't break these conditions. And what, but once these conditions are broken, then there's a war that breaks out. And we see this amongst conflicting nations, don't we? Why we have war today is because conditions have been broken. Because peace treaties are not kept. And like it is in, the, in how we have wars today and between nations, many people are having relational wars amongst each other. And this is why many relationships are blowing apart families and friends and colleagues and church brethren. 
And this is, this is a, not what God intended for us. This, it doesn't matter how much we have achieved in life, no matter how much we've become successful in our job or school, if we, are, if we have relationships that are like ticking time bombs, we are not living the successful life. The way, um, <coughs> this way of, of living will only bring more strife to our lives. And it's not the way of pursuing success the right way. So how do we set up relationships properly? How do we build the right relationships? So this is, we're going to look at the um, story of Joseph again, the final time today. And we're going to be looking at how um, God helped him to build proper relationships in his life. Now, as you know, we've been, we've been um, studying him and his relationship with his brother over the, brothers over the past few weeks. And it's been an up and down roller coaster with his brothers. The brothers uh, who were jealous of Joseph sold him as a slave to, to, to Egypt and, it, and, and also uh, left him as an aban- abandoned him in the pit um, and took his clothes and, and coat and, and, and all, it, all he had and left him stranded. And this, at age 17, this happened to Joseph and this brought tremendous pain to Joseph. That even after 20 plus years, he saw his brothers again, it, it it brought back all these emotional um, wounds. And he started weeping uncontrollably at the sight of his brothers. But God healed him, amen? And that's what we talked about last week, how God healed Joseph so that he can take the mask off and be uh, a brother again to his brothers. And so, you know, what happened after that? Well, you know, as God was repairing Joseph, God, there was still a repair that needed to be happening in the relationship with his brothers. One thing for God to repair your life, but how is your relationships? You know that God doesn't just care about souls, but he cares about relationships. Oftentimes when we focus on the gospel, we focus on the soul. That the soul be healed. That the soul be touched. That the cross came to save people so that they can go to heaven. But the cross didn't just come to save people, but also to heal relationships. <laughs> Oh, come on, somebody. He wants us to also have good relationships. He, gave, he healed us to have good relationships. Oh, hallelujah. He wants to save relationships. Oh, glory to God. And so this is important, and, and we see this here in the passage, that while God was taking care of Joseph's heart, he was also taking care of his relationship with his brothers. It needed repairing. There were still some unresolved issues or conflict between them. You know, Life may be going good with you, but how is it with your brother and sister? Hello, somebody. Life may, God may be working in your life, but how is your relationship with your spouse? Life may be going good with, with your life, but how is your relationship with your parents? How is your relationship with the people that are closest to you in your life? And the brothers were still feeling the guilt from their wrongdoings towards him. And what was happening here is in, in, in the passage we read this morning in Genesis chapter 50, um, we see that Jacob, the father, had died, (coughs) had died. And you come to understand as you read this chapter that it was their father that was kind of holding them together. And once he died, the insecurity of the brothers surfaced and they were concerned about how Joseph would would treat them. Um, The brothers did not know if they were in good standing with, with Joseph. And Joseph having all this power, they are at the mercy of his, of his leadership. Let's read here in Genesis 50, verses 17b and 18, to see what the brothers, how the brothers approach Joseph after his father's death. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. And his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. This is what they said to Joseph to stage an apology and set a condition for which uh, they can um, get out of possibly dying uh, at the hand of Joseph. In other words, the brothers feared Joseph and now that their father was dead. And they brought a peace treaty. To bring peace. They brought a condition. What was the condition? Please 
make me your slaves. Make us your slaves. We will, we will be your slaves. Spare our lives. Don't let us die. But allow us to do uh, something to make up for the wrong that we have done against you. And they wanted Joseph to accept them, to accept this offer. Um, this was a peacekeeping strategy. Peacekeeping. They're trying to keep the peace. <coughs> and in keeping the peace, they thought, you know, let me do something. Let me do a favor to avoid any kind of um, issues to, to rise up. But the problem with uh, keeping the peace in this way is whenever you set conditions for which you determine the health of relationship, the number, re- num- number one reason why you set conditions is for the number one person. Who is that? Yourself. The conditions you set in the relationship is really for you. For the, it's a self-serving mechanism we put in the relationship to make sure that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, we are okay. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Are you with me? Right? The, the, the brothers were not thinking about Joseph or the relationship. They were thinking, how do we put ourselves in a position where we don't get killed? While they were feeling guilty, genuine guilt, they were trying to control the consequences. Hello, somebody. And rather than just saying, I'm sorry, and letting the consequences fall where they may, they tried to control the consequences to make sure they can get out on a decent path. And so this is, this is the problem with making conditions in relationships because it always has us looking out for ourselves. Another problem is when we create conditions, it has everybody looking at the conditions instead of looking at each other. We're all constantly looking at the line. Did they cross the line? Hello, somebody. Did they step on my toes? How dare they? And you easily get offended. It's like driving the car, right? And you... Someone cuts you off. You now get angry. How dare they come in front of me like that? And now you zoom around them and do the same thing to them. Those those are conditions. We've set the conditions that if you really respected me, you would not have cut me off. You crossed the line. So I'm going to take you out. Hello, somebody. Is it just me or is it? You got to pray for me then. There's a lot of Holy Ghost prayers that are happening when I'm driving. Lord, keep me safe right now. Amen? But, but th- this, is, this is the idea that um, causes us to have relationships, and we make those relationships not based on unconditional love, but we make those relationships based on conditional love. I will love you if you do these things for me. And this is why God doesn't want us to be peacekeepers in our relationships, He wants us to be peacemakers. God doesn't want us to be peacekeepers in our relationships. He wants us to be peacemakers. Peacemakers handles conflict differently from than peacemakers. Peacekeepers look for the line in the relationship so as to maintain the peace. They are looking for conditions in relationship that makes it fair for them. But peacemakers look to throw away the line in relationships. They don't look for conditions. They don't look for it. And this is how God helped Joseph in his relationship with his brothers. He didn't look for the conditions. Rather, he looked to throw out the conditions. He looked to be a peacemaker instead of a peacekeeper. And Joseph, in order for him to become a peacekeeper, peacemaker, though, He had to become or be a child of God. Hello, somebody. Because you cannot be a peacemaker if you're not a child of God. Okay. Are you hearing me, church? I don't care how good you are, but you have to be a child of God to be a peacemaker. Because you can't make peace by yourself. Because there's only one prince of peace. Hello, somebody. There's only a place. There's only one place where peace comes. And Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I give unto you, not as, I, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. To have true peace comes from the Prince of Peace. Hello, somebody. To have, to have this kind of peace, the scripture says, the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. To be a true peacemaker, you need to be a child of God. That's why it says, Jesus said this in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they are the children of God. Oh, I need somebody to preach with me this morning. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, if you don't get this point, everything I say after, you're going to stumble upon. Because you're going to look at this sermon and say, well, that's too hard to do. But I want to tell you, when God is for you, hello, somebody, who can be against you? When you have the Spirit of God in you, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you have that in your mindset going forward in this sermon, you will understand, I, I can do it. Tell your neighbor, I can do it. And tell your neighbor, you can do it. Because we are a child of God. Oh, hallelujah. You need to be a child of God to be a peacemaker. Because if you don't have, if you're not a child of God, you will not have what it takes to throw out uh, the line. When you try to throw out that line or throw out that condition, when someone crosses that line, you're, gonna, you're not going to You're not going to last. You're not going to have the fortitude to withstand it. You're not going to be able to turn the other cheek when someone slaps it, slaps it very hard. And, and, and you're not going to be able to, to recover from it. You need to have the, the peacemaker, the peace of God inside of you be, to be able to overcome. <coughs> There's two things <clears throat> that God does for us when we are children of God and how to become a peacemaker. The first thing is we serve a God who knows how to heal the cheek that just got slapped. This is why we need God. Because some people slap is pretty hard. And it hurts. And it causes wounds. But there's one who can heal those wounds. Hello, somebody. Oh, come on. Did anybody know that God is a healing God? Oh, I used to stumble upon this all the time. Said, Lord, how do I do this? And they just keep hurting me. He says, you can do it as long as I keep healing you. Hello, somebody. As long as I keep healing you, you can, st- you can get, keep getting hurt. Hello, somebody. And it didn't make sense at first, and then I saw the cross. And Jesus was getting hurt left, right, and center. And he got hurt, 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 hurt. And I said, how did you handle that? And then when he, when he was hurt on the cross, and they, they, they mocked him, he looked, and, and they said, if you were the Son of God, come down. And he said, forgive them, for they know not what they've done. I go, God, how did you do that? Because I have a God who's healing me in the process. You see, you can't, you can't make it if you don't have a healer in your back corner. <laughs> You can't make it if you don't have someone that is bandaging you up with every whip that you get. Oh, hello, somebody. That's what makes you keep, you can't keep a God man stand. You can't keep a God man down because God always picks up that God man to keep standing. Hello, some. It's not you that's standing. It's God in you that's keeping you standing. Oh, glory to God. It's God in you that keeps you taking those blows. And people looking at your life, how are you surviving this? This is only by the grace of God. Oh, there's a, there's a term it's called. It's called long-suffering. Hello, somebody. It's the ability to go through a suffering for a long time and not let the suffering derail you. Matter of fact, the suffering only strengthens you. Oh, I feel like preaching. We are hard-pressed on every time. We're perplexed. We're struck down, but we're not out. Oh, glory to God. But there's the grace of God that is in us that keeps us getting up. Hello. Keeps us smiling. Keeps a peace on our mind. That when we smile, it isn't a manufactured smile. That when we worship, it isn't a manufactured worship. Even though our life is all falling apart, there's a peace of God that surpasses all understanding and gives me a praise in the house to say, hallelujah, anyhow. My back is out, hallelujah. My bills are, are, are all over the place, but hallelujah. My marriage is messed up, but hallelujah. Because the peace of God is surpassing, oh, I feel like preaching, is surpassing all understanding. There's a praise in my mouth, not because of my ability to praise, because there's something inside of me. Jeremiah said that I, that I feel like fire shut up inside of me. You know, Jeremiah, he was a weeping prophet. He had a lot of things to cry about. But when it came time to praise, it wasn't his praise. It was the Spirit of God. Oh, come on, somebody. That gave him the ability to say hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. The only way you can be a peacemaker is if you got the healing power of God working in you. That keeps you standing. And you will declare what Isaiah 57, 17 says, No weapons formed against me shall prosper. One slap. No weapons formed against me shall... Next slap. Oh, you want to take the person out. <laughs> but the Lord is healing you in the process. That you can say, No weapons formed against me shall... Take your best shot, uh, de- uh, devil. Take your best shot. But I'm standing. I-, I think Job had that kind of fire in him. Every time one lick came, he, he-, he had to praise his God. 
Didn't mean that life was going well for him. Didn't mean that he was happy, but he knew how to praise anyhow. He knew how to look up to the hills from whence cometh his health and strength. His health and strength cometh from the Lord who maketh the heavens and the earth. He said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He knew how to praise the Lord when it was going tough. Because he had a God that knew how to heal. But not only does God help the child of God uh, to get healed from a, a, a cheek slap, but he also knows how to make uh, that slap uh, worth it for your life. Hello, somebody. He not only, he not only heals you, but he, he not only heals the cheek that just got slapped, but he helps to make up for the slap that you just felt. He helps to make up for the slap that you just got felt. God has a way of uh, giving double for your trouble. Hello, somebody. He has a way of, you know, paying someone's debt that is owed to you. And this is exactly what happened uh, to Joseph in the passage, that God was able to pay the debt that was owed to Joseph from his brothers. That when the brothers tried to pay a debt, when the brothers tried to say, you know what, we will be your slaves to make up for the debt, Joseph, uh, uh, you know, looked at them and said, hey, you don't have to do that. I've already forgiven you. Uh, you don't need to ask for forgiveness. You know, I don't, I've already forgiven you. You know why? Because God has already paid up your debt. Oh, hello, somebody. Uh, you don't need to pay the debt because God has already paid up your debt to me. He said, he said, guys, what you intended for evil, <laughs> what you intended for evil, God intended it for good. <laughs> you see, Joseph learned a long time ago, even before this conversation with his brothers, that the evil that happened in his life was, 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 was for the purpose for which God's goodness can happen in his life. <laughs> oh, glory to God. And this is what God was able to help Joseph to understand. That our righteous tears and suffering never gets wasted on God. He knows how to give us double for our trouble. He knows how to give us uh, good things that comes from bad things. He knows how to turn things around. Hello, somebody. For our good. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord according to his riches in glory. And he told his, Joseph told his brothers, you don't need to repay the debt owed to you. God paid it, paid it up for you. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. And this is what takes us to Genesis 50 verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for a good to accomplish what is now being done to the saving of many lives. All the things that Joseph went through because of his brothers. Oh, come on now, somebody. All the things that you are going through right now because of people that are treating you wrongly. Look at it like Joseph looks at it. It is all for God's glory. Oh, come on, somebody. God knows how to pay the debt that is owed to you. You don't have to look to people to make it up to you. God knows how to make it up to you. Your suffering is actually working for your blessing. Hello, somebody. Your suffering, your cross, is actually working for your blessing. It's your promotion. You see, when uh, people suffer without God, it destroys them. But when we suffer in God, it promotes us. That's why Jesus said, when you are reviled, when you are persecuted for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. What does the scripture say? For great is your reward from heaven. Oh, come on. Anybody, anybody tell, understand what I'm saying? I know it's hard to understand suffering sometimes. It's hard to figure it out. If God is so powerful, why does he allow it? That's a Bible study discussion. You need to come out on Wednesday and we'll talk about that. We're studying the book of Revelation where we have a whole bunch of discussion on evil and suffering and all that stuff. But right now, we need to understand that God takes our suffering and turns it around for your good. Hello, somebody. God takes it. God takes it and turns it around. He makes up for it. So whenever you're going through suffering, just look up to God and say, God, what is this for? What are you setting me up for? Now, in the moment, you may not feel like it's a great setup. But, you know, if you, if you hang in there, if you, if, you, if, you, if you hold on, amen, do not get weary of well-doing. After a while, the scripture says, there shall be a harvest. Oh, come on. Everybody likes harvest time. Nobody likes sowing and, and nobody likes the toil of summer. But if you just hold on, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen thine heart. Weeping endures for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. God is going to bring double for your trouble. 
Job had to go through a series of tests and a series of suffering, losing his family, losing his money, losing his dignity and, his, and losing his, 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 his fame. But at the end of it all, he got double for his trouble. He got double the amount of family. He got double the amount of wealth. He got double the amount of, of prestige and praise. And he got double the amount of revelation of who God is. Tell your neighbor, you're going to get double for your trouble. Keep holding on. Keep holding on. God knows how to make up for the slap. So in order to be a peacemaker, you need to be a child of God. Because only God can do these things in your life. <laughs> Joseph got rid, of, got rid of the line. He threw out the line. He threw it out. He threw out the line, the conditions that were dividing him from his brothers to have real relationship with his brothers. Joseph didn't feel the need to get back at his brothers. He didn't feel the need to, pay, uh, to have them pay for their sins because God made up for the injustices that, caused, that, were, um, that they caused. God paid up their debt that was owed to, to, to him. In other words, this leads me to my uh, next point. God makes up for the injustices in our relationships so that we can be peacemakers in them. God makes up for the injustices in our relationships so that we can be peacemakers in them. Now, this goes against our flesh, right? Even as I preach this, I can feel some of you. I can feel your flesh. But I got the spirit on me, so I'm not worried. <laughs> right? right? But, but it, 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 it rubs our flesh. There's no way I'm going to let anybody step on me. I'm going to get them back. No way. But in order to become a peacemaker, you know, if you're going to be a peacekeeper, that's the life you're going to live. It's going to create a lot of strife and it's going to create a lot of stress in your life. But if you live as a peacemaker, you will have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And, and this is, um, so how do we become a peacemaker? What does it look like in our relationships? How did Joseph turn the other cheek to his brothers? Well, let's read it here in Genesis 20, verse 21. <coughs> it says here, so then... <coughs> Don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And you reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Well, here is the first thing that, that Joseph did to demonstrate peacemaking um, skills. <coughs> he told his brothers that he already forgave them. The scripture says here, he reassured them. What were they asking? Forgive us. Forgive us. We will forgive us. We will be your slaves if you forgive us, and he reassured them, you don't need to do that. It's already done. You don't owe anything to me. Right? He told them uh, that there is no debt owed to them. That you don't need to be my slaves. You know, sometimes it's tempting when someone asks for forgiveness and offer things to pay it up, and it's like, ooh, this, this could be in my favor. <laughs> you're going to do, you're, so, 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 <coughs> So, you know, you're going to do dishes for the, I don't have to do dishes anymore? This is, I, I, this could be really good. I, let me think about this. Uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's put that in place as of today. No more dishes. You know, you got to be careful with that <clears throat> because when you take those kind of conditions, what happens when the dishes don't get done? Then when the dishes don't get done, uh, excuse me. You promised me that you will take care of these dishes. Why are they not done today? Oh, I just, I just forgot. That's no, not acceptable. You said you were going to take. So what happens? You start focusing on the conditions, and we throw the relationship out the window. So you got to be careful. That, that's not peace. What, that's, that, 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 is, that, is, that is not peace. It's still, it's, still a, it's still a relationship. It's a time bomb waiting to happen. Ticking time bomb waiting to happen. And Joseph said, I don't want your conditions because you can't live up to them. You will fail them. You're not perfect to be uh, faithful in those conditions. I have a God who supplies my needs. I don't need you to supply my needs. I, Jesus is all I need. Hello, somebody. He's all I need so I can be the best version of myself to you. I don't need you to treat me right for me to be a good person to you. I'm good because God is good. Hello, somebody. I don't need you to make me good. I don't need you to supply. I got a God who is, supplies all my needs, and because of him, I can be good to you. And so Joseph told uh, these guys, I don't need it. I don't need it. I, I thank you for it, but I want you to know the debt has already been paid. The debt has already been paid. <coughs> and so that's the first way. The second way Joseph demonstrated uh, peacemaker ability uh, to his brothers 
was he showed them forgiveness. He didn't just say it. You know, sometimes we say, yeah, I forgive you, but we still have the, uh, yeah, right, you know, under our breath. You know, we still harbor that anger. We still harbor that resentment. That, that when we say it with our mouth, but our actions don't show it. We actually give mixed body signals. You know, we talk a great talk, but our walk is totally in the other direction. I, I, I have to confess, this was back in the day, you know, when I was uh, much younger, much younger in the Lord. And this, this girl at school wanted to date me. And all the young people, their ears probably propped up here right now. This, 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 this girl wanted to date me, and, and she actually came to me at the end of school and said, we're going out. I go, what? Yeah, we are going out. And I'm going, oh, okay. But I didn't have the heart to, to you know, kind of tell her I wasn't into her. And number one, I was into God. Hello, somebody. I didn't have time for that. Hello, somebody. Trying to be into God anyways at that age. <laughs> But, but I, 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 truthfully, I wasn't into her, just period. But I, I, you know, told her, you know, anyways, I didn't have the heart to tell her. So I was trying to be nice to her and, and delay the answer. So she, she was saying, we're going out. And by the time I um, finished my volleyball practice, everybody, all her friends knew that we were going out. I'm going, Lord, what am I going to do here, you know? And, and um so I finished my volleyball practice. She's waiting for me. And uh, at the end of volleyball practice, which was two hours, so she wanted me to drive her home. So I drove her home. And, you know, and then I went to work. And what happens? I have one of my co- um, coworkers tell me, so I hear you're going out. With I'm going, what is going on? I'm going, what am I going to do here? This is just crazy. So I'm giving her mixed signals, right? I, 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 I'm saying everything's okay, but inside, I'm what? Not being truthful to what is going on. I get to school the next day. You know, she's waiting for me to walk me to class. I go to lunch. She's waiting for me at the lunch to have lunch together. And I'm burning inside. Somebody save me. I didn't have the heart to tell her the truth because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Uh, and so I finally mustered up the strength after that bas- basketball game the next day. She was waiting at the school for me still. And um, I told her after I dropped her home, I can't do this. I told her, you know, I just want to focus on God. I want to help get things right with my youth ministry. And plus, my parents wouldn't even let me date. So I don't even want to deal with that stress right now. And she said, you know what? I perfectly understand. No problem. I got it. I thought everything was great. I thought, great? That was easy. I should have done that a long time ago. You know, by the next time I get to school, pure cut eye. Not from her, but all her friends. I felt like an outcast from the whole school. And I go, Lord, what is happening? I'm just trying to be a good guy. <laughs> Eventually, she came around and apologized, and we had a good laugh after, and we're good friends. But I just want to share that to say, sometimes we send mixed signals. You know, we, we, we say one thing in fear of not to offend and not to hurt, but then our body is saying something else. And in Joseph's situation, when he said he was sorry, he genuinely meant it. The scripture says here that he spoke kindly to them. He didn't just say it, but he, his whole posture was emulating it. Amen? <clears throat> he did not give lip service, but generally forgave them. <clears throat> In these <clears throat> responses to Joseph, and i got to wrap up here. Um, in these responses to Joseph, I mean, in these responses to his brothers, Joseph cared more about the relationship than his brothers. I'm oh, sorry, God cared more about his relationship than himself. Amen. Joseph cared more about his relationship with his brothers than himself. He was willing to throw out the line. He was willing to make the shift from becoming a peacemaker, from a peacekeeper to becoming a peacemaker. 
Joseph demonstrated the fourth and final skill of emotional intelligence called relationship management. Now, you should have received some handouts today, take-home assignment handouts to try some of these relationship management skills. <coughs> I hope you've been doing these assignments. They have uh, tremendously helped me in some of the things that I've been learning about myself. And just take three of the, the 17 tips that are there and give them a try and see if God can help you be improve in your relationship manage, management skills. Relationship management is your ability to communicate and build bonds with others to help them change, grow, and develop and resolve conflict. This is what relation management does. Mission management is helping you to invest in your relationships, that they can become healthy. In other words, my next point here is when you care about building healthy relationships around you, you are demonstrating strong relationship management skills. When you care about building healthy relationships around you more than building up yourself, you are demonstrating um, strong relationship management skills. And, and so <coughs> this was important for Joseph to learn as I close here. This was very important. As you reflect, you know, at, at the end of all this, at the end of all this, here he is as a pharaoh, as a uh, governor in Egypt, having all this power, having all this money, being able to save people's lives, uh, being on top of the world. Now his father's passed on, but he's finally able to connect with his brothers and his family the way he wanted to uh, after going all through the stress that he went through. At the end of his life, he can truly say that God is faithful. And he's looking back when he was 17 years old, and he can recall the dream that he had, that he was 17 years old, that he would be the center star amongst his family who would bow down before him. And I believe he's got a new interpretation of the dream. <coughs> he, he now understands what that dream really means. His dream, maybe his first interpretation, he was excited about what? His family bowing down before him. But now after it's all done, he looks back and says, oh, that wasn't the focus. The focus is for me to be a servant to my family. And, and this is really what Joseph talks about in Genesis 50, verse 21. He says, so then, don't be afraid. <clears throat> I will provide for you and your children. And that part here, he said, I will provide for you and your children. It's speaking about Joseph's family and the generations that will come after his family. And this is very important because Joseph, for the first time, realizes that he went, all, went all, through all this for this moment, at this time, to be there for his family. I don't know who's in your life that's giving you stress or whatever's going on in your life that's stressing you. But God is setting all of this up so that someday you can be there for someone in your life. You see, if Joseph didn't get thrown in the pit, he wouldn't be there for his family. <laughs> if Joseph didn't get sold into, sold into slavery, he wouldn't be there for his family. Matter of fact, what would happen is the famine would have, hap would have taken over the land and not only would it have killed all the people, but his family would have been killed as well. And this is what Joseph realized, that all this happened so I can be there for you. <laughs> and why was this family so special? This is one of the most important families in all of ancient Near Eastern history because this family was what produced the, the most important nations in all, of nation, uh, in all of ancient history, which is the nation of Israel. And this, and this nation is what God produced the most important human, oh, come on, <laughs> in all of human history, and that is Jesus Christ. Oh, glory to God. Joseph was carrying out his dream so that Jesus can come into the world. Oh, come on, somebody. Joseph did what he needed to do so that God's plan could work through Joseph, not just for his family, but also for his family, family, and his family, family, and his family, family, which led to a point that the whole world can be touched, all because Joseph was obedient. Oh, come on, somebody. All because Joseph was obedient. God works in our lives the same way. The gospel is still being written on tablets in heaven the same way. Our names are written in the book of life. There is a redemption story when we go to heaven that we will tell because God wants, to, wants everyone to see how everyone's lives were weaved in such a way for the provisions of God's final kingdom to come into this world. 
This leads us to the final point. As we serve to make our relationships healthier, God brings life out of them to bless us and the world beyond. I want you to stand all over this place. <coughs> and time is far spent, so we won't uh, take any more time. But if you can grab a, a neighbor beside you, if, just don't stand by yourself. Don't sit by yourself. Just, and if you see someone sitting, just grab them. <laughs> Find someone to just hold hands with. I want you to feel that hand. That is not just any hand. That's not a mannequin that you're holding. That hand has blood running through it. That hand has life running through it. God made that hand. God made that person. I want you to feel the connection you have <clears throat> with that hand. That connection is a very important connection. And in God's church, he wants to knitly join us together. He doesn't just want us to be individuals in his church, but he wants us to have healthy relations. In your home, you're not individuals. In your home, he wants you to have healthy relationships. If ever a time the world needs this message, it's today. If ever a time the church needs this message, it's today. Individualism is the culture and the cultural norm. And many people are going through this world not being able to fully understand what a healthy relationship looks like. But God gave the mandate to the church to be the ministers of reconciliation. Right? We are the ones that can bring true peace to the world. He wants us to be peacemakers. We're not going to act like the world acts, but we're going to act like Christ. As you hold that hand, I want you to pray for that person beside you. I want you to intercede for that person and let the Holy Spirit move in you to pray for the person beside you. All over this place. If you don't know how to pray, that's okay. Just receive what the Lord has for you. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you can receive him today. For he is holding your hand right now. And he's letting you know that he died on the cross for you so that you can be a child of God, that you can be a peacemaker. All you got to do is accept him as your personal savior and accept that he died on the cross for your sins and you will be saved. And so all over this place, I just want us to pray. <coughs> Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this moment that you have moved in this service. I thank you for these people that you have brought into this house for this day and those that will hear the sermons series <coughs> online that you will awaken and, 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 and uh, grow in us the heart of Joseph um, to be emotionally intelligent um, to walk in the spirit in such a way that we will not let our emotions run our life. I pray, oh God, that people will be empowered to understand what makes them tick, understand how they can live this life abundantly, and understand what the peace of God really is. Understand that you're a God that heals, and you're a God that makes up for the evil that happens in our lives. And Lord, so that we can be there for the relationships that are in our life, not to look at the conditions or the lines of, that were people broke against us, but Lord, that we can love the way that you've called us to love. <coughs> that we can forgive the way that you've called us to forgive. That we can invest in relationships. That it won't be a one-way street, but it will be a mutual uh, street in which two people can truly walk together together in love, where healing, forgiveness, repentance can all take place, bringing us closer together in relationships. Cause those relationships to happen in the home. Cause, cause those closer relationships to happen between marriages. Cause those closer relationships to happen between uh, parents and children. <coughs> cause those closer relationships to happen between brothers and sisters in Christ. When conflict arises, let those relationships cut closer. When misunderstandings arises, 
Lord, let those relationships get closer. When, when, <coughs> when things get bottlenecked and people can't agree on anything and it's causing a stalemate, Lord, let those relationships come closer together as you touch hearts, as you mold hearts to live the life that you've called us to live. For it's in these close relationships that your life, your abundant life spreads and blesses us and blesses the world beyond us. It's this life that you bring, this abundant life that extends and touches our environment and changes our atmosphere and, and changes the systems in which our world is, is, is built upon. It's in these relationships, Lord, that you came to die for, to heal and to save those which are lost. Have your way, I pray, all over this place. Move in such a way. Move in such a way that helps us to be united for your purpose.